Welcome to our week 17 Horseshoe FAQ. I am Lara Overton alongside the voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor. Before we get into all of the conversation, because there's a lot to dig through this afternoon, Matt, happy new year. Hope you enjoyed your you know, time with the family, of course, but there is a lot to unpack and a lot to go through in terms of playoff scenarios, all of the playoff potential for the Indianapolis Colts. But in general, let's just break down the AFC and just how wild this is to talk about an 11 win team potentially not making the playoffs in 2020. Well, first of all, happy new year to you. Happy new year to all the Colts fans out there. And hopefully we're talking about pleasant trees in the new year uh, on, you know, the afternoon of January 3rd. Obviously that's week 17, the day of the game, Colts and Jaguars. Um, before we do that, Lara, I'll ask you how, how nitty gritty do we want to go with this? Like how down in the weeds? Do oh. we really? Cause I mean, we can get like down in there. If well, you want to, if you want to go, part of that is to be determined by the questions that we get. So that's a good time to remind you to submit your questions there in right. the comments and we will work through all of those. But I mean, I think knowing the, the audience that we typically have and the engaged fan base that we have, <laughs> they want all of the nuggets that you have, you know, they want every little <laughs> bit of nitty gritty. We're talking, digging into the dirt yeah, on all of this that we have. So I, we, we, we've got the time. I mean, where else are we going? That's right what now. I'm saying. Like it's 12 degrees outside. We can unthaw this if you really want to. Like we can, I can tell you exactly what's going on. So pour it all on me, <laughs> pour it all on me, because we're basically preparing today for what we're going to be talking about for the next few days. And certainly what we're going to be no talking doubt. about on Sunday afternoon on game day, because we'll have our Colts pregame show. We'll be joined by Casey Valier with that, of course, as well. Jeffrey Gorman involved in that JMV. we got a whole lot of voices who are going to be weighing in. So we want to be sure that we yep. deliver to everyone everything that they need to kind of mull over for these next few days so that they know exactly what to expect come Sunday afternoon, Sunday yep. afternoon at 425 for the Indianapolis Colts. But those one o'clock games are going to have implications for how yep. the Colts go into this week 17 matchup with the Jags. Absolutely. All right. So cut me off anytime you, you feel like it. We can we can kind of explain. We'll play if the go. Oscar Oscar music and we'll please, you know, send please. you off. Please, if you don't mind, just cut me off whenever you have a question or whenever I'm going too fast and I need to slow down, just let me know. Um, but no, this is crazy. I mean, first off, we need to know how just wild the AFC field is this year. I mean, with all the parity in the conference, you're only talking about as of right now, there's only three teams that have clinched a playoff spot in the conference, Lara. That represents the fewest in a conference entering week 17 in seven years since 2013, right? So you got that going on, plus there's five 10 and five teams right now vying for four playoff spots, including the Colts. So bottom line, as we all know, one of those teams is going to go home. They're going to be left out in the cold, and you're going to have uh, a, a 10-game winner. You're going to have the first team to win at least 10 games and not make the playoffs since the 2012 Chicago Bears. Um, normally Lair, I mean, 10 wins, that's, that's more than good enough to get you into a six team field. Uh, we we've seen in years and you past, would smash right? the NFC East. No question about it. I mean, <laughs> we've seen in years past a nine and seven wild card team. So the fact that you're not going to have potentially an 11 win team make a seven team field. Are you kidding me? I mean, we talked okay, about this I have to last tell you year. when I was trying to work through all of this, you remember the scene from the last dance, which feels like a lifetime ago when Dennis Rodman is illustrating and he's <laughs> going all of this. That was, that was me. That was my trying to work through all of these where I was like, okay, cause I need to see it visually. So I was like putting like sure. the bills over here and the, the Ravens over here and the Browns <laughs> here. And I was trying to finagle all of this. So thank God you are here that the people actually get the, uh, the information rather than, you know, my over here trying to telestrate <laughs> and describe it all. Well, that's what you need. You need like a Venn diagram to put this all into perspective, right? So, I mean, I mean just to, to go back, I mean, remember, remember this time last year when we found out that the NFL was expanding to seven teams mm -hmm. and we were all thinking, oh boy, is this worth it? Do we really need to do this? I mean, are we going to have a, a nine and seven team or an eight and eight team potentially make the playoffs? I mean, for the Colts sake, thank goodness it's a seven team field this year, considering again, uh, a 10 win or maybe an 11 team win might not, the, might not make the playoffs. Case in point here, since 1990, when the playoffs expanded to six 
teams. The last 73 teams, Larry, to start the season 10 and 4, all went on to make the playoffs. So here you go. You got the five 10 and 5 teams, the Colts, the Titans, the Browns, the Dolphins, and the Ravens, right? So in order for the Colts to clinch at least a wild card spot this season, they need to, of course, beat Jacksonville on Sunday. That has to happen. Have to. None have of these to. scenarios exist without the Colts not winning on Sunday. So they got to beat the Jaguars. And by the way, that's not a given, right? Because the last two Jaguar wins are against the Colts. Week 1, 2020, week 17, 2019. So you can't overlook them at all, even though they've lost uh, 14 straight games. They always play well for whatever reason against the Colts. So the Colts have to beat the Jags, and they need one of the following four things to happen. Ready? The Browns need to lose at home against the Steelers. By the way, the Browns are favored by 10 points in that game, and it sounds like the Steelers are not going to play uh, some of their starters on both sides of the ball, including Ben Roethlisberger. So that's kind of a bummer uh, for the Colts. That's not, not going to help them. You would like the Steelers to play at full strength in that game. The Ravens need to lose in Cincinnati against the Bengals. Remember now, the Bengals are playing some good football. They've won two games in a row, uh, but heading into that game, the Ravens are favored as of right now by 11 and a half points. Now, for what it's worth, now this is where it gets, this is where I've started clawing into the, uh, the dirt here a little bit. For what it's worth, Cincinnati has won 12 consecutive home finales when headed into the game with a losing record and I read won, this today. Unreal. They've won, they've won 17 of their last 18 home finales. So let's go Bengals, right? They need we need Cincinnati to win that game. And the Dolphins need to lose in Buffalo against the Bills. The Bills are Which favored that by that seems like potentially your best case scenario, yeah. perhaps. But the Bills are being coy on whether or not they're gonna have their starters. Right. Yeah. The Steelers have flat out said that, hey, since we didn't get the number the number one overall seed in that first round by that was our only incentive, whereas the Bills, they're still as of right now, uh, kind of on the fence on how hard and, and how much they're emphasizing going after the number two seed. Remember, the, the number two seed potentially gets two home playoff games instead of uh, the three seed that's only guaranteed one home playoff game. Um, so the Bills are favored by a point and a half into that game. So we'll see how full strength they are on Sunday as far as that goes. And so all three of those games that I just talked about, Lara, those all start at 1 o'clock. So the Colts will know if they're involved in a win and in meeting with the Jaguars by the time they kick off that game at 425. So I'm that's the good, that's say, the good part. I'm also going to say one thing uh, kind of like – good karma maybe i don't know for the colts is that you know even if the bills do put in a backup quarterback there there's some good relationship good rapport between backup quarterbacks working out well in terms of frank reich <laughs> his history about... for buffalo like i mean i don't know i i got, I got i'm feeling something here that's something that coach reich was asked about this week is if yeah. he had any favors that he could call in up, up to buffalo which i thought i was very entertained by <laughs> coach got a good chuckle out of it as well you would hope that there would be some good mojo between the Colts and the Bills, uh, given this scenario where the Bills can help out the Colts in this situation. There's no doubt about it. Plus, you know, if, if Tua ends up starting on Sunday for Miami, which it sounds like he will, uh, you know, sometimes I think this gets overplayed. But you're talking about, you know, January football in Buffalo and you're talking about Tua right? Coming from uh, well, you, Miami. Wait, you experienced it in background. 2017. You oh, experienced what Buffalo was like in December. It's absolutely brutal. So you're talking about one of the toughest places to play weather-wise. I know home field advantage as far as the crowd is out the window, but you're still talking about weather. I mean, all those guys uh, in Buffalo, they've been dealing with this now for the last, you know, five or six weeks when it starts to get cold in the month of December in Buffalo. So you think that might be an advantage for them in this game because it is played in uh, in Buffalo. But all right. So to take it a step further here, we're not done. The NFL, it's all about drama, right? So they flex the Colts and Jags game. The Titans and Texans game has also been flexed to the 425 slot. That's important. The reason they did that is because. Uh, the AFC South is still on the line between the Colts and the Titans. So if the Colts beat the Jags and the Titans lose in Houston to the Texans, the Colts, Lara, actually win the AFC South for the first time since 2014. By the way, the Titans are a seven and a half point favorite in that game. Uh, but Deshaun Watson, we think, is going to start 
for the Houston Texans. And we've seen he, he you know, he's so good. He's he single handedly almost beat the Colts twice this season. So he's a very, very important player With in this like equation. Primarily like what third string receivers. Yeah. Chad some Hansen practice squad guys. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Some practice squad guys. That's how good he is in terms of elevating, you know, the talent around him. So um, the Colts, as, as I said, they can still win the AFC South for the first time since 2014. Um, if the Colts, so here we go. We're going to be scoreboard watching during this game. Uh, and you, you hate to think like this, but if the Colts finish 11 and five and they don't win the AFC South, Lara, it'll be the first time since 2012 that an 11 and five record was not good enough to win the AFC South. So it's just crazy to sit here, you know, on this, whatever day it is before week 17, and be talking about the spectrum of things that can happen for the Colts over here. You've got, the Colts missing the playoffs altogether with an 11 and five record becoming just the third team ever in the history of the league to miss the playoffs with that good of a record, 11 and five to all the way over here, winning the division, hosting a playoff game and clinching the number four seed. Like the range of possibilities uh, is just nuts here. So as of right now, the Colts are the last team out of the playoff picture heading into the game. So that means if the if all of those teams win, the Browns, the Ravens, the Dolphins, and the Titans, the Colts miss the playoffs, and you don't want to think like that. Um, and so you ask yourself, what are the odds of all of those teams winning? Fortunately for the Colts, it's not good. I talked to uh, somebody today from the website 538.com, which is like a sports analytics website. They crunch the numbers. They do all the calculations. You know, they run the odds 50,000 times and they spit out some formula. They say that the odds of all of those teams winning and shutting out the Colts is only at 9% this weekend. So the Colts have a 91% chance, according to, uh, you know, 538.com of at least somebody giving the Colts help. And the Colts obviously have to take care of business on their own. So bottom line, it's going to be a fun week 17. I know I gave you a lot. That's probably sensory overload and all the numbers in the math. Uh, but the Colts do not completely control their own destiny. They got to beat the Jags and the blueprint for Colts fans. Maybe just write this down on like a post-it note somewhere. You know, put it on your forehead so you don't forget while you're watching the game. Colts fans should root for the Steelers, the Bills, the Bengals, and the Texans on Sunday. That is your blueprint for success if you're a Colts fan. Hey, all I care about, you're telling me there's a chance, right? <laughs> there's there's can't, more, can't, there's more than a healthy can't use chance. It enough. Cannot <laughs> use it enough. And you wanna, if you wanna be along for the ride with us on Sunday, we'll be on the Bell Tire Radio Network, bringing you all of the coverage from Lucas Oil Stadium that kickoff at 4:25. We'll of course have all the pregame show and everything building up too. Getting to a few of these questions now. Amanda says, "How are you going to manage the O line this weekend?" We had some breaking news out of uh, West 56th Street today. Coach Reich announcing that Anthony Costanzo will mm -hmm. have his season ended with ankle surgery. He's going to undergo surgery. I believe tomorrow. So that is something, of course, that you have that concern now at left tackle, what you do with, with that position. The good news is Braden Smith was activated off the COVID list. So you do have Braden Smith back. Yeah. What is the outlook though, for the left side of that offensive line? And it seems like there could be potential for Quentin Nelson, maybe to move there to that position and then have some movement there at guard. Yeah, I think everything's on the table. I, I think everything's in play here. I mean, we've seen a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas when AC went down for a handful of plays. Uh, as you said, uh, Quentin Nelson kicked out to left tackle instead of left guard. The only thing, the only hiccup as far as that goes, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It very well could. Uh, but in that game, in that situation for those handful of plays, the Colts put Joey Hunt in at left guard but he's now back on the Colts practice squad. And as far as I know, Larry, maybe you have an update on this. Um, he was on the COVID list on the practice squad last week, and I haven't seen any update on that. So I'm assuming that's still in play for him. Uh, but the Colts still have Danny Pinter um, that they could put in. He's an interior player, the rookie out of Ball State. Um, they still have Jamarcus who, who Webb. At center for Ryan Kelly for right. a game earlier in the season. Was that the Tennessee game? It was. Yeah. So <laughs> we saw swirling up here. Mm -hmm. That's why I need you to keep me straight. We saw we saw Jamarcus Webb come in. He was the you yeah. know the third string left tackle, if you will. Um, we should also mention Will Holden is not going to be able to play. And I thought he played pretty admirably. Um, 
against Pittsburgh because, I mean, we, we talked, you know, incessantly last week about how good that pass rush was for Pittsburgh. Uh, they came after Will Holden, and I thought he played very, very well. So not having him is is – even more of a problem uh, personnel wise for the Colts. Plus we have to still throw in the possibility that they could sign somebody this mm -hmm. week to bring in and start at left tackle or potentially add depth. So bottom line here, everything's still in play for the Colts. Quentin Nelson moving out to left tackle, having somebody else play left guard. That's certainly still a possibility, but it's not ideal to go into such an important game. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. Like we, we just talked about it for five minutes. This is a playoff game. The Colts have to win. If they don't win season's over, right? So uh, this is like the first of many playoff games, hopefully for the Colts. It's not ideal to have one of your most valuable players not available for the rest of the season. That brings me to Bill's question. Very timely. It says, is the playbook really open considering what is on the line? I think you're open to whatever's going to give you the best chance to win. Oh yeah. I mean, literally it's, it's so if that's winter, Naheem winter Hines home. wildcat. Like we saw a couple of weeks ago, Everything. whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And, and speaking of the playbook being open, you know, take it to, to take it a step further. I mean, you're talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars, Lara, that have literally nothing left to play for. You know, this coaching staff's probably not going to be there next year. This is going to be the last hurrah for a lot of guys, a lot of coaching staff. Um, so they want to win just for the sake of winning to feel good about having, you know, a one, one other win, uh, on the resume here in 2020. So you might see reverses on kickoffs or, you know, double passes on offense, like on both sides of the ball. I think the playbook should be wide open because obviously the Colts can't hold anything back. They got to win. They have to ensure the victory. But if you're the Colts defense or on special teams, be aware for the kitchen sink from the Jaguars in this game, just trying to get a win and spoil the party for, uh, for the Colts. Douglas is asking about Michael Pittman and says, why is Pittman not more a part of the offensive game plan? I'm going to say that maybe part of that goes to coach Reich has talked about, you know, scripting out the first half of plays, but very much getting a, an ebb and flow, getting a feel for the game and, and how, you know, they're uh, opposing defenses are playing them and feeling things out. So I think that mm -hmm. part of it is, is, you know, maybe when he's in there, it's the way that defenses are attacking him while how they're covering him. And just the fact of the matter that we've seen those opportunities where you've gotten Zach Pascal going of late, you want to play that hot hand, my goodness, you've got the run game. You at least got the run game going really early on with Jonathan right. Taylor. So that's all going to come into play. But in your opinion, what do you think about Michael Pittman? Yeah. See, I, I always kind of take, uh, I, I understand the question. Um, but you know, everybody likes to play Monday morning quarterback after the Pittsburgh loss. And they say, why didn't we run the ball in the second half? You can't have it both ways, right? I mean, you can't have, you can't, you can't say, why didn't we get Michael Pittman more involved? Uh, and, and then kind of gripe about the running game. Like there's, there's so many weapons on this offense. Um, and I kind of disagree. I think Michael Pittman is very involved week to week. I mean, mm -hmm. he's got, you know, at least three catches, I think, in, in 12 games this season. I mean, that's that's a really good amount of targets and catches for a guy in his rookie season within this offense that, again, not to beat a dead horse, because I know we talk about it every single week, but at least seven guys catch a pass in every single game. Right. So this has been very much a spread it around type of an offense uh, week to week. You don't know, you know, who, who's going to stand out, so to speak. Lately, it's been Naeem Hines and, and Jonathan Taylor and, and, and T.Y. Hilton, because those are your, you know, to steal a quote from Rick Venturi, those are your ambient players. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are your best matchup players. But you still have strong role players with Jack Doyle, who caught 50. I mean, we, we should mention him. He had, he had a season yeah. high 50 yards receiving. Right. So, I mean, in the last couple of weeks, it's been like, where's Jack Doyle? And boom, there he is. He has his best game of the season. Uh, Trey Burton. Right. So I think the Colts have just a solid, really good cast of, of players uh, on their roster. And again, week to week, based on the matchups, you don't know who's going to really kind of uh, pop out in the, in, in the box score when the game's over. Um, plus, the Colts are just running the heck out of the ball with great success these last couple of games. I mean, in the last six games, they're averaging 140 rushing yards per game, over 108 of their last nine. So the ground game is really coming on. I know people were you know, upset about that. So I just I, I think we have to kind of dial it back a little bit and say, this is an offense that's not going to rack up 550 receiving yards every single game or total yards, I should say, right? It's going to be a balanced attack. And we kind of have to say, 
all right, if, if this guy's not, I mean, if Michael Pittman doesn't go over a thousand yards receiving, which he won't this year, it's, it's not a, he's not a bum. It's not a down year for him. It's just, he is, he is performing his role within this. You also offense. think about too, the number of games that he had to miss due to the injury and when, where right. that is and how that factors in it as well. That's something to keep in consideration. It, it's easy to kind of put that in the rear view mirror because it's been a while back, but that certainly is still going to have potential implications for no him doubt. and maybe where he, where he feels, where his strength is, all those yeah. things. I, you know, this is the second or third time in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a question on Michael Pittman. I think he's had a terrific season. I really do. I mean, he's won his matchups, um, you know, more consistently than not. Uh, he is doing everything the Colts thought and, and talked about him doing, lining him up and, and you know, put him out in the boundary, one-on-one -on -one matchups, the slants, the goes. Uh, he's, I thought he's performed very well. There's, there's not much that I've seen out of Michael Pittman that's to be desired, if that makes sense. I, I think he has uh, got a tremendously high ceiling. Um, and again, I think his role will grow if T Y Hilton is not back next year in free agency, maybe a couple of other, uh, other guys don't come back in free agency, uh, to, you know, maybe his role, uh, and his usage expands, but as long as the Colts have this solid cast of characters on the team, I think Michael Pittman has performed, you know, e exactly how the Colts envisioned using him in year one. Tremaine asks, what do you think the defense, we're going to flip the other side of the ball, defense needs to accomplish to be successful as a team going forward? And I think with, with Jacksonville, one of the things is you've got to stop their run because that's one of the ways they ripped you apart in week one was James Robinson, the undrafted yeah. rookie. I mean, he was slashing that Colts defense week one. So I think that in, in terms of moving forward, we're only talking about this Sunday. I think one of it one of those components has to start right there, honing in on him and trying to stifle a bit of their run game. Yeah, I completely agree. Although James Robinson's not going to play on Sunday, he's still out with an injury. So oh. uh, it's unfortunate for him because I think he was only about 35 yards away. He's had a great season, um, but he's only about 35 yards away from breaking the NFL's all time rookie record for rushing yards as an undrafted free agent. So it's a shame he's not going to get there by missing the last two games. But uh, to your point, they still have Dari Ogunbowale, who came in. He averaged over five yards per carry uh, last Sunday against the Bears. So they, you know, they don't have great numbers really in any category on both sides of the ball, but they have been able to run the ball efficiently in terms of the yards per carry the last couple of weeks. But now to take it a little bit of a step further, this, this is a Colts defense that has to sort of you know, sure some things up because it's been a little bit of a decline. You know, the first nine games of the season, I did some numbers crunching this week, the first nine games of the season, you know, the Colts were top five and basically every category points yards. They're still top five in rushing, but the passing numbers have declined and right around the time they played the Packers. So the first nine weeks, the last six weeks, starting with that green Bay game, Lara, the Colts are giving up. Let's see. In, in the last six games, they're giving up 112 more yards of offense to opposing teams, 124 more passing yards per game, and around nine more points per game compared to the first nine games of the season. So all of a sudden, all these things have kind of ballooned up a little bit. Plus, what's a little bit discouraging is that the explosive plays in the passing game, those are up as well. And that's kind of the hallmark of this scheme and the, you know, the way they play it under Matt Eberflus is we're not going to give up the big stuff. We're going to make you go the hard way down the field. Uh, we're going to make you dink and dunk. We're all, we're all going to be really good tacklers. We're going to come up and bring you down. The fact that the over the air stuff or the deep ball stuff has really plagued the Colts. That's concerning. They got to they got to get that figured out, especially in Week 17, heading into hopefully a decently long uh, playoff run. How much of that is attributed to the strength of quarterbacks that you've that you've oh, played in that stretch? Because you talk oh, about that, the Green Bay game. It. That's what yep. you're talking about. Green Bay, you talk about Deshaun Watson, Derek Carr, and, yep. and then Ben Roethlisberger. When I'm thinking back to that stretch, right. and and I think you would have had Tannehill in there as well. So right. is that how much how much do you take that into account? Well, I think that's definitely just to part balance of out the argument. No, that's that's definitely that's a that's a good uh thing you point out right there that's definitely part of it that's contributed to the inflated numbers you talked about it. Aaron Rodgers Ryan Tannehill throw out Ryan Tannehill a little bit because he didn't have a, a big game mm -hmm. passing but 
the Colts didn't slow down Derrick Henry in that game. So they got their yards. Who a different can way. slow down Derrick Henry? Well, I mean, that's... It, was, <laughs> it was a, it was a different uh, preferred way of, of racking up yeah. the yards and the Colts weren't able to do that in that game either. You had Deshaun Watson twice. He was over 300 yards twice against the Colts, Derek Carr and Ben Roethlisberger. So that group combined again, the last six weeks, They've completed over 70% of their passes, Lara, for an average of 322 yards passing per game, 11 touchdowns, only four picks, and those quarterbacks have combined for a 103.8 passer rating. So it's kind of in the same line in terms of what happened last year. Remember last year in the last quarter of the season, the, the passing numbers against really good quarterbacks, they kind of really exploded on the Colts. They got to get that figured out, and I'm not sure – I'm not smart enough to, I mean, if I knew I would tell Matt, Matt Eberflus and then he's a lot smarter than me. Right. So for whatever <laughs> I mean, he'd reason, put you on staff, hundred <laughs> percent. So they got, if, if, if I knew I would tell him, so they got to get that figured out. And um, yeah, it, it's definitely a little bit concerning. And it, it, you know, in the second half against Pittsburgh, when they had a, a ton of big plays, two of them for touchdowns, they had the 39 yarder to Deontay Johnson and the 25 yarder go ahead to Juju Smith Schuster. Um, that was a big factor in why the Colts uh, let that lead slip away. Well, we are talking about week 17. Matt Taylor broke it all down for us in terms of all the different scenarios. Now we just sit back and cannot wait to watch it all unfold. We'll be 10,000 strong at Lucas Oil Stadium for the game on Sunday as we welcome in Jacksonville. And we'll be doing some scoreboard watching throughout the day. So we'll be keeping you updated on our game and keeping you updated across the league on the Bell Tire Radio Network. Myself on sidelines, Matt on play-by-play, -play, and of course, Rick Venturi, and then Casey Vallier along with this too for all of your coverage on Sunday afternoon. Well, in the meantime, have a happy new year, have a safe new year you and, too. you know, stay healthy. And <laughs> I will see you on Sunday afternoon. We appreciate all of you guys coming in with the fantastic questions all season long on horseshoe FAQ from Matt Taylor. I'm Lara Overton. Happy new year.